Greetings and welcome to Daniel chapter, really the end of chapter 11, picking up in verse 36, and then we'll go uh, through chapter 12, verse 13. I've entitled the lesson, Those Who Sleep in the Dust Shall Awake. Again, that comes right out of the start of chapter 12. Welcome to lesson 16. Can you believe it? Uh, 16 weeks ago, we started on this journey. In many places, it seemed like we were running so fast yet it still took 16 weeks to accomplish this journey. I've, I will miss Daniel, but I'm looking forward to our next study. We'll talk about that in just a second. So those who sleep in the dust shall awake. Just by way of a reminder, our next gathering is scheduled for June the 3rd at my house. That's a Friday. Again, we'll start about 6 p.m. Possible options for the video that we'll watch. Again, you'll vote on these. Lee Strobel, The Case for Christ. Now, this is the film so this isn't the documentary of his life, but this is really like uh, the evidence that resulted in him coming to faith. If you remember, he set out on this journey. He was a reporter, um, and he set out to prove that you know his wife believing in Jesus and this whole religious thing was scandalous, credulous. Um, and so he really set out to, to prove uh, it was false uh, and ultimately gave his life to Christ. The next one is the God Delusion Debate. This is between Richard Dawkins and John Lennox. Uh, the focal point is Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion. Um, fantastic debate. I think it's in, uh, real well worth the watch as long as you don't get angry about things that a rank unbeliever who's an outspoken atheist might say about God. Another good one that what you could vote on, What You Aren't Being Told About Astronomy, Our Created Solar System. Uh, this is by Spike Pissaris. Great video, uh, really focusing on all the evidences within our solar system of special creation and a lot of those things that point to a young creation. And then finally, uh, the marks of a cult, a biblical analysis, really gives you four signs of a cult. Uh, dives into the big cults, obviously, uh, Mormonism, Jehovah Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventism, um, but really gives you four ways to easily identify a cult. So these are all great videos. So uh, we'll be voting on one of those. And if you so if you want to Google them, uh, please do. And uh, when we get ready to open up the voting, that way you can vote for whichever one you prefer. Uh, and starting next week, uh, just in a few days from when I'm recording this, as we take our journey into First and Second Thessalonians. Uh, as we dive into 1 Thessalonians, the power of the gospel. Now, obviously, no two books speak about, no single book speaks about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ like 1 and 2 Thessalonians. It is the theme that runs through both of the books. In fact, I would encourage you in my class, keep a running list of everything that Paul says about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think you'll be amazed at two points. Number one, as you see the list of all the things he says about the return, I think you'll be very amazed, and equally all the things that he does not say. I think you'll be amazed about that at all as well. But again, the power of the gospel, which will be the introduction in chapter one uh, there in 1 Thessalonians, and so I'm really excited about that study. And so again, as we move forward, uh, we find ourselves this week back in Babylon, although technically we're not in Babylon. We're actually 18 and a half or so miles out, standing at the Tigris River. Uh, but again, just by way of reminder, this is an artist's rendition of the city of Babylon. You can see the Euphrates River that runs through the city as well as been moated around the city. Um, you can see the processional way that goes to the Ishtar Gate. That's the Edomananke. In fact, one of the... Uh, Folks, one of the, one of the uh, believers in the class said, you know, I will, I will always remember, I think he said the Ishtar Gate, just because that's how we open every lesson. And speaking of that, there's an artist's rendition of the Ishtar Gate, the processional way, uh, the mosaic that goes down each side of the uh, processional way. There's the Edom and Anki, the platform between heaven and earth there in the background, the Temple of Marduk that uh, Nebuchadnezzar built on top of it. Uh, but again, we're not technically in Babylon today. We're actually 18 and a half miles out side the city by the Tigris River. Uh, this is the Ishtar Gate there in the Pergamon Museum. Again, for size, those are two adults and a child standing in the gate, a massive gate. This is not a replica or a model or a reproduction. This is the actual gate dug out of the sand outside of Baghdad and reconstructed in the Pergamon Museum. I'm sure they cleaned it up, but it's absolutely gorgeous. Can you imagine what it looked like in its day? Uh, this is uh, the mosaic, one side of the processional way. Again, absolutely gorgeous, the line with the eagle's wings. Uh, again, we're no longer, as we find ourselves here in the third year of the reign of Cyrus, 
Uh, we're no longer in the Babylonian Empire, but we are in the Medo-Persian Empire, and we're in the third year of uh, the reign of Cyrus the Great. Um, we are right outside of Babylon there at the Tigris River where this vision occurs. And just by way of reminder, again, the third year of the reign of Cyrus the Great. So it's around 536 BC that we find ourselves today. So here we are, those who sleep in the dust shall awake. So a reminder as we transition, picking up at the end of chapter 11 and moving into chapter 12 and ultimately finishing the books, um, we're continuing in an event that started in chapter 10. So you can kind of lose continuity because 10, 11, and 12 is so much material, but it's all one event. Daniel is an old man now. He's in his mid-80s. <clears throat> Again, he's about 18 miles outside of Babylon by the Tigris River. We do not know what brought him there, uh, nor do we know exactly who else is with him, although other people were with him. They ran off afraid. Now, we know that Daniel had been mourning fasting and praying due to all the problems associated with the Jews and the issues that they encountered in their attempt to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. They fully intended to rebuild the temple, but that work has been stalled. No doubt that is why we find our brother mourning, fasting from delicacies and wine, praying. Um, because of what has happened. No doubt there would have been rejoicing initially as the decree went out by Cyrus, uh, but now there's mourning because the work seems to have failed. So again, it is the third year of the reign of Cyrus. We're going to pick back up in that running um, explanation of the kingdoms that was given by the angel. So again, the angel just picked right back up and he talked briefly about Cyrus. Um, he then moved into um, a few kings that would follow Cyrus he then moved into Alexander the Great, um, and then he moved into the breaking up of the kingdom into the four kings that followed Alexander at his death. And then he began to focus really on two kingdoms within those four, and that was the kingdom of the Ptolemies to the south and the Seleucid Empire to the north. And if, so if you just reference Jerusalem, uh, the Seleucid Empire was definitely north and east, the Ptolemies uh, was south and slightly west. And so we went through all of that, and we come to verse 36, and it's really, although there's no transition in the text, many scholars believe that the text does transition. They believe it transitions away from talking about all of these wicked kings and what they've done and how bad they did and everything they did, and transitions to now begin talking about the final Antichrist. Now again, there's no marker that it transitions. There's no, hey, this is the Antichrist. In fact, you could read right over it and not even think it were, were it not some of the things that it says. It is worth noting that not everyone holds the position that this is the final Antichrist. I believe it is, uh, but I recognize that it does not necessarily have to be because no matter what, even if it is a king in history, this king is serving as a picture of the final Antichrist, a type of the final Antichrist. Now, again, I believe it's the final Antichrist, and there's some reasons that I have, but I'm smart enough to recognize as you deal with apocalyptic prophetic literature, it is very hard to nail it down in advance. It's much clearer in the rearview mirror. But again, just recognize as we pick up in verse 36, theologians believe we are transitioning to the ultimate final antichrist but not all but not all believe that so this person is going to have characteristics that seem to be like antiochus epiphanes uh, but ultimately they believe it's the ultimate and final i believe it's the ultimate and final uh, personification of all that he pointed to in the final antichrist um anything else we want to say, say here other than scholarship is divided i guess i'll say what i wrote here I say all this to say that although I think and indeed believe that the text is transitioned to the Antichrist, it's unwise to be dogmatic, for the scriptures are not dogmatic. We can be bulldogmatic, to use my pastor's word, where the scriptures are clear, um, and where they're not as clear, then we just really need to explain what we believe, be, use clear words, and just move forward. So with all that being said, what we're going to do is just walk our way um, through these last verses of chapter 11 and then transition into chapter 12. 
Picking up in verse 36, and the king shall do as he wills. Now, this has been common with many of these kings. It's like a running commentary. They're doing everything they want to do. Obviously, God is, is allowing them to do it, um, but they're fulfilling their will. They're, they're punishing people they want to punish. They're elevating people they want to elevate. They're doing as they will. Verse 36b, and shall speak astonishing things against the God of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished for what is dec his decreed shall be done. So here this boastful one is even pictured as speaking astonishing things against the God of gods, against Yahweh. He's, he's pictured as speaking out directly against Yahweh and, and God's going to allow him to prosper till everything, till the indignation is accomplished for what has been decreed shall be done. And this should be re very reassuring to believers. This should have been reassuring to the nation of Israel as Antiochus that came up. They recognized that God had described this person. They recognized what had happened. God had told them was going to happen. And with any amount of scriptural savvy, they recognized it was because of their sin that it had happened. Uh, but here we see this one like Antiochus, but probably much worse. He was arrogant. He's very prideful. He speaks out things against the true in the living God. Verse 37, he shall pay a no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other God for he shall magnify himself above all. Now we get glimpses of Antichrist in many modern day atheists. Richard Dawkins, to give one example, <laughs> I talked about that debate between Dawkins and John Lennox. Dawkins speaks blasphemous things against God, but even Dawkins has never attempted to declare himself to be God. You see, this one will magnify himself above all gods, including the true and living God. So he's interested in no God, nor is he interested in women. Notice that phrase, or the one beloved by women. The phrase, the one by loved by women, probably brings, brings with it the idea of he's totally uninterested in the love of women. Now that could mean he's homosexual, but I don't think you have to go there. I think really what it's pointing to is that he has no interest in anything other than himself. He's the ultimate megalomaniac. He's the ultimate power-hungry antichrist. Um, Chuck Missler claims that the desire of woman is a, is a messianic phrase. I, I cannot find support of that in the scriptures, so I only say it because he said it. I don't, I don't agree. Um, I do agree, um, and I think it was my pastor who pointed out, you know, in Daniel's time, everybody worshiped some God. This person is being detected, depicted as the true atheist, and indeed he is. He is the ultimate atheist, um, if this indeed is the final Antichrist. He shall honor the God of fortresses instead of these. A God whom his fathers did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. So this person will worship, according to the text, the god of fortresses. The idea seems to be military power and might. He will spend lavishly gold, silver, precious stones, costly gifts to support his military power, to build his military empire. Power is all that he's concerned about and what the god of war can provide him. So it seems that power, might, and control are clearly defining features of this king. He is both wicked and indeed powerful. Verse 39, he shall deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign god. Those who acknowledge him, he shall load with honor. He shall make them rulers over many, and he shall divide the land for a price. Now, this is all very similar. He, he again, the idea is this whole new god, and it's the god of war. It's the god of fortresses. Um, and with power, he intends to crush all power. And it seems here in verse 39 that anyone who will support him, anyone who will get into a league with him, he will reward, make them rulers over land, um, divide the land with them. He will honor those who honor him. And that's definitely something that's common in our day and time. Verse 40, at the time of the end, I love this. Now we're thinking, okay, I, all right, we're boiling it down. At the time of the end, the king of the t south shall attack him. Now, again, we see the language, and, and I explain this to the class. This is couched in language that could make it fulfilled any time from the very moment the angel gave it. 
It's couched in that same language of the king of the north, the Seleucids, and the king of the south, the Ptolemaic Empire. And here the king of the south shall attack him, but the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. And again, we see, I don't believe the final Antichrist is going to use chariots and horsemen. I think what we're being told is he's going to use modern weaponry, but we're being told in apocalyptic language. So we don't need to be dogmatic that he has chariot and horsemen. We miss the whole point when we do that. We need to understand that he's using military might to control and to exercise his power. He shall come into countries and shall overflow and pass through. So again, the language connects us to chapter 11 it, like it could have could have been Antiochus. Um, but a, a few observations. He is going to use military forces. He is going to overflow. He is going to crush people. Um, and it's all instigated as the king of the north comes upon him and he comes upon him like a whirlwind. Verse 41, he shall come into the glorious land and tens of thousands shall fall, but these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab and the main part of the Ammonites. So he'll come into Israel, but many will fall. This is like Antiochus, right? This is the same kind of idea, except it's worse. Some will be delivered from his hand. This is surprising. And then we're told Edom, Moab and parts of the Ammonites. Now, again, we shouldn't focus on who are the Edomites and who are the Moabites and who are the Ammonites. Rather, we should recognize that those are geographic regions inhabited by peoples, and more than likely, that's what we're talking here. So we're talking the area around modern-day Jordan, more than likely, that um, is delivered out of his hand. And we're not given any explanation beyond that, just that. Verse 42, he shall stretch out his hand against countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. So again, he stretches out his hand, Egypt is swept under his sway, um, and Egypt shall not escape. Verse 43, he shall become ruler of the treasures of gold and silver and all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and Cushites shall follow in his train. Again, we see this language, uh, this apocalyptic language. But news from the east and the north shall alarm him, and he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. Um, so again, he takes down everybody. This news comes from the east and north, and just about everything is east and north from the area of Jerusalem. Um, so he goes out to destroy. You can picture him going out to devote them to destruction. Verse 45, he shall pitch his palatial tents. Now, will he indeed in, dwell in palace tents? Probably not, but he'll pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain, and he shall come to an end with none to help him. So he's pictured here as pitching his tents either between Jerusalem and the Mediterranean Sea or between Jerusalem and the Dead Sea. It doesn't matter. It's the same area, essentially. Um, he sets up camp, but he will be destroyed and none to help him. Now, here's the whole point. I read all that to get to this point. The man of sin, whoever he is, for all his authority, for all his alliances, for all his supposed power, this is evil world ruler, world power, will go out, not with a bang, but with a whimper. This final, is this the final Antichrist? Probably. Is it a type of the final Antichrist? If not, definitely. But like Antiochus, like Hitler, like Mussolini, like many Antichrist, small Antichrists before him, he will be put down like a dog. Not in a massive battle, but by the breath of the Lord Jesus' coming, the reign of the man of sin will simply end. As we come to Daniel chapter 12, I always like to talk about, okay, what's it all about? So Daniel chapter 12 and the first four verses remind us of two important points we need to carry through the rest of Daniel with us. First, God will deliver his people. Even in the most difficult times, God will deliver his people. Number two, one day, one day, all who sleep in the dust will be raised, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting shame and contempt. But one day, all who sleep in the dust will arise. As we move into chapter one. So at that time, 
And again, the time would be the time of the final Antichrist, if indeed that's the final Antichrist, that that time is clearly in context. The chapter division is a little awkward here because we're right in the middle of a run-on thought. But at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge over your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as has never been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So verse 1, the at that time, there will be a time of trouble. In fact, trouble such as was never since there was a nation till that time. We talked about the that time. The that time is during the time of the man of sin, during the time of the son of perdition. It connects us back to Daniel 11, 45. At that time, there will be this time of trouble. Now, this time of trouble is spoken of all over the New Testament. Jesus referred to it as great tribulation, Matthew 24, 15 to 31, Mark 13, 14 to 26, Luke 21, 20 to 28. But it's not just Jesus who talked about this time of trouble. The apostles talked about this time of trouble. Paul, as he's writing to Timothy, said this in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 4. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to their parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, lovers rather than lovers of God. Beware, Timothy, know this, in the last days perilous times shall come. Paul, as he wrote to the church in Thessalonica, we think about our study that's upcoming. He said this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, as he's writing to clear up even some confusion from the first letter about the Lord's return. He said, now brethren, Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, so we're talking about the return of Jesus and the resurrection, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if it from us as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means. So apparently many had worried the day had already came. He said, no, no, you know it can't come. Verse three, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. There'll be this falling away, this tribulation period. But not only does the falling away come first, the man of sin is revealed. The man of sin must be revealed before this day comes. The son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So said Paul to the church in Thessalonica. Going back to 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul writes, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith. There's that falling away. Giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. John Lennox, the one who's in that debate with Richard Dawkins, said this. He wrote this actually. It's hard to get one's mind around this grim statement. The time of Antiochus Epiphanes was horrendous, as was the period around the fall of Jerusalem. The Holocaust beggars description. But Daniel indicates that there is even a worse time to come at the time of the end. You and I need to be ready for these days, but we also need to recognize that God is protecting us and God has already determined to shorten the length of that period. Notice in verse 1 that Michael will stand up. His name means who is like God. He is described as the great prince. He's one of the archangels. The word translated great means important, magnificent, powerful, large, great. And he will stand up for God's people. So at that time, Michael will be instrumental, we don't fully understand how, in the deliverance of God's people. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, the angel said, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. 
God will deliver his people. His people here described as those who were written in the book. So here in these hard and difficult times, in these times of the Antichrist, and all that that could mean, God will deliver his people. We could stop right there. That's the message to never forget. Regardless of what happens, regardless of how difficult the times, God will deliver his people. Jesus summed it up in John 10 this way, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. You and I, regardless of the difficulty in view or at hand, are kept, according to Peter, by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Back to verse 1. So notice the people who are delivered are described as those who are found written in the book. The book is described in a lot of ways in the Bible. My book, written in heaven, book of life, God's book, book of the life of the Lamb. The bottom line is the saved people, those who are written in the book, are the ones who will be preserved. So at that time, this time of great trouble, Michael will be instrumental in the deliverance of God's people. Again, a good word for you and I. It reminds us of what it says in Hebrews chapter 1, that angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who are heirs of salvation. So what a beautiful promise buried in an amazing prophecy. God will send his chief angel, his archangel, to ensure that no harm befalls his people, befalls you and I. Verse 2, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, the idea of sleeping in this particular usage is a biblical euphemism. It reminds believers that although their body is in the grave, dead, the person is very much alive and in the presence of God. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body to be at home with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus God will bring with him those who've fallen asleep. Another euphemism for Christians who've died. And here they're pictured as coming back with the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes to gather his living believers together. They will meet him and them in the air. They will all get their glorified bodies, first those who come with him, then those who are on the earth. What a great day that will be. That day of coming when all those who are in the sleep arise, who sleep in the dust. Now notice, many shall awake. Another here, a biblical euphemism. In this case, it's the idea of the reanimation of body and spirit. This is the resurrection. And some shall awake to everlasting life, and some shall awake to everlasting contempt, abhorrence, everlasting dishonor, everlasting shame. Now again, before I say another word, the Bible is clear. To be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the Lord. So when we die, our body is placed in the ground, but our spirit, our real personality is ushered into the presence of God. We're not asleep. We're not unconscious. We're very much awake. We're very much alive. We're very much alert, and we're worshiping God. Equally, those who are lost, their body goes into the grave. Their spirit is immediately cast into hell where they await the final judgment. They are already, like the rich man and Lazarus, like the rich man in particular, are under the judgment of God waiting their final judgment and their, the, for hell to be thrown into the lake of fire. But we are all waiting for that final judgment. But the point is this, and this is exactly what Jesus said. And we'll just pick up in verse 28 of John chapter 5. Do not marvel at this. And he had talked about the authority he has. We'll just skip that for the moment. Do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those that have done good unto the resurrection of life and those that have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Just like the angel told Daniel, Jesus told us through the scriptures, Jesus told those who were listening to him there in John 5, the horror, the hour is coming, this period of time when all that are in the grave shall come forth. 
those that have done good unto the resurrection of Zoe, the resurrection of life. And those that have done evil unto the resurrection of Croesus, the resurrection of judgment, the resurrection of damnation. And that is exactly what the angel just told Daniel. Paul said it this way, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and following, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. At the twinkling of the eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet, trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. For when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, when this mortal shall put on immortality, then will be brought to pass the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. So the angel visit that started with a discussion about Cyrus and the kings that would follow him, some of the kings, led to a brief discussion about the Antichrist and his ultimate and quick demise, which led to a discussion about the trouble that would occur under the Antichrist, which led to a discussion about Michael, who would protect God's people all the way up and until the resurrection and the reception of their new bodies. That's what we've seen in a very short period of time. That's the history we've covered in just a handful of verses. But we've seen throughout the Bible how the people of God have been protected and at times directed by angelic intervention. One final point. Even this time of trouble cannot destroy the certainty of the resurrection of the dead, the certainty of you and I, God's children, that we will be raised from the dead, that we re will receive our new glorified bodies. Verse three, verse three. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book until the time of the end. Many will run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So here it seems the, annual, the angel wants to provide a fuller, deeper, and more meaningful description of those who are written in the book, and so he does. He defines them first as wise. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. Now the Bible is clear about wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and destruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Or we could go to 1 Corinthians 1.27. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the things which are wise. Yea, God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. When we talk about the wise shining, it's wise because they're wise because they place faith in Jesus Christ. They're wise because they've hooked their life on God's revelation. They're wise because they believe God, not because there's wisdom in themselves. But not only are they described as wise, so they're described as written in the book, they're described as wise, they're also described as those who turn many to righteousness, and they shine like the stars forever and ever. Um, and here you should see a saint of God being pictured as one who's turning other people to faith, but one who's reflecting the glory of God, one who's shining like the stars forever and ever. Verse 4 in view of everything that uh, the angels just talked about, Daniel is given some clear directions. Number one, shut up the words. The idea is to protect the words, to keep the words safe, to secure the words. Number two, seal the book. Satham is the Hebrew word. It, it's the same word that means to stop up a well or to close a gap in the wall. So it's, it's not just to hide them away, and it's not just to preserve them, but it now brings with it the idea of closing them up, um, preserving them and hiding them away. That's the idea of these two things being stated together. Protecting, preservation, keeping safe, hiding away. And then finally, we're told when, until the time of the end. Now, as you hear that, the immediate question, okay, is so when is the book going to be open? When is the time of the end? And good news, um, the scripture is very clear on this point, so we don't have to guess our way through it. We can simply talk our way through it. The Bible refers to the, the time here that Daniel describes as the time of the end in the New Testament as the last days. Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners hath in times past spoken to us 
by the fathers hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. We could quote Second Peter 3, 1 through 4. Again, we are living in the last days, the days when this book was to be open. It had been protected and it had been protected till the coming Messiah, because when the Messiah came, it would connect all of this together. Isaiah 3, 53 made no sense until Messiah came. And now even a grade school child who knows anything about Jesus, who's ever heard about Jesus, um, recognizes that Isaiah 53 is about him. But then equally, the book of the Revelation makes this crystal clear. So we would agree that John the Revelator and Daniel very similar revelations between the two of them, a lot of common themes. Daniel is told to shut up the book, to seal it up, to hide it away, to protect it, to preserve it until the time of the end. Let me show you what John is told. This is the end of the book of the Revelation. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brother and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Don't fall down and worship me. Verse 10. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Now, we could, we'll stop right there, but you get the point. Here we are, 500 BC, seal it up, preserve it, hide it away. 536, if we want to be exact. Here we are, 95 AD. No, no, do not seal it up, for the time is near. The time is at hand. So again, um, we are living in the day when all of this is now connected together. When what the Old Testament uh, readers read these things through smudgy glasses, it looked foggy. Isaiah 53 was foggy. Hosea 11.1, 1, all they saw was Egypt and the nation of Israel being called out of Egypt. They never saw God's son. They didn't see all these connecting points until the Messiah came. Many will run to and fro. And again, the idea of running to and fro is seeking something. In this case, it appears to be knowledge. And knowledge will increase. Now, it's been said that knowledge doubles every 10 years. And I'm not sure how you measure that or who knows that for sure. Um, but I don't think that's what the angel is talking about. I think about the, the, what the angel is talking about is the knowledge and the understanding around this point, around all of these prophecies that were smudgy to the Old Testament saint that are gaining clarity to the New Testament saint because the Messiah has come. Verse 5, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream and one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? So here Daniel now sees two other what appear to be angels, uh, one on each side of the Tigris, and then he hears one of them speak to the one clothed in linen who was above the Tigris. No doubt this is the same one we saw in chapter 10. More than likely this is a Christophany. This is a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. I would direct you back to Daniel 10, verses 2 through 6. We won't spend the time reading them now. But he asked a question out loud, no doubt asking it for Daniel's benefit. The question, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Now, you know, as you think about that, hey, that's what we've been wanting to know for years. That's what every false prophet has wanted to know. That's what everyone has wanted to know. When will this happen? So we're all like on the edge of our seat. I feel myself gripping the edge of my chair to lean forward to hear what the one who is standing above the waters, clothed in the linen garment, the one who is more than likely a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ, I'm, I'm at the edge of my seat wanting to hear what he says. And Daniel said, I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever that it would be, here we go, a time, times, and half a time. And that when the shattering of the power of the, of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. So obviously in the Bible, a person raises a hand to take an oath. 
Here we see the sovereign of the universe raise both hands and swear to the God of heaven that it will be for a time, times, and half a time. Here we go, the three and a half. This is the three and a half that echoes back to Daniel chapter 7. Uh, Nero, this is the three and a half that echoes back to almost to, in Daniel 8, to Antiochus. And this is the three and a half that repeats itself in various forms in the Revelation. This is the time, times, and half a time of Revelations 12, 14, where the woman was nourished in the wilderness. This is 42 months in Revelations 11, 2, where the holy city was trampled. This is 42 months in Revelation 13, 5, where the beast was given authority, or the, given the right to exercise authority. This is 1260 days of Revelation 11, 3, where the two witnesses prophesied. This is 1260 days of Revelations 12, 6, where the woman was fed in the wilderness. This is a time, times, and half a time. Now, that's probably not the answer we wanted, but that is indeed the answer. But the next part of the answer is shocking. And this is the part we need to hear. Namely, until the power of the holy people has been completely shattered. These words combined, these phrases, holy people completely shattered, should shock us, should immediately capture our attention. Two quotes. Sinclair Ferguson said this, when the, power, quote, when the powers of darkness have done their worst against the kingdom of God, and the truth of God has been set at a final devaluation, God will act, close quotes. Uh, Lingen Duncan said this, quote, when evil has done its worst, we are told as soon as it finishes, shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be, events will be complete. When evil has done its worst and the hopes of the people of God seem shattered, then God will act. The grim work of the oppressors will roll on and on and on. But at the appropriate moment, God will intervene. Now, an initial look, that's shocking. But I would remind you, it's exactly what we see time and time again. When the people of God are at their most helpless point, then the kingdom of God will be ushered in. The triumph comes not as a buildup to triumph, but as the snatching out of defeat and the acquisition of victory. This is Calvary all over. This is the ministry of Paul all over. This is exact, this is the New Testament church throughout the New Testament all over. Verse 8. And I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, Oh my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, Go your way, Daniel for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. So Daniel hears, but he doesn't understand. So just a quick point of application. We read something in the scriptures and we're not sure what it means. We do not understand. Now that's not something that should disturb us, shock us, or cause us to just believe something so that we have something to believe. But rather it's something that should move us to continue to study God's word, continue asking him to reveal his truth to us, being a man of faith does not mean we understand everything. Daniel was indeed a great man of faith. He didn't understand this. It turns out, according to Daniel, a life of faith can be lived with unanswered questions. I, don't, I guess that's part of what faith is all about, not always having all the answers. So when we come across some of these things, like we're about ready to come across in just a few verses, don't feel like many who I, see, I read behind and listen to, that you've got to have an answer. There's got to be an answer, and I've got to have one. Sometimes the answer might just be, I don't know. But God does, and I trust him. And equally, I would say, when we come across these things that we don't understand, just remember, number one, that's humility before God. God, I don't understand. Help me. But it does put us in mighty good company with our brother Daniel. And now this is, I love verse 9. Look at what the angel says. Go your way, Daniel. The words are shut up. We've already covered this. Go, Daniel. Live by faith. 
God's going to reveal all this at the point in time. I almost picture like Dan, here Daniel is standing with, before the sovereign one of the universe. He's been revealed so much. He's been told so much. And now Jesus just looks at him, Christophany, pre incarnate appearance of Christ. And he says, Daniel, you're dismissed. Go your way. These are sealed up until the end. It's amazing. History is his story. And the sovereign of the universe has brought us, you and I, to this point in his story for such a time as we find ourselves in. We may not have all the answers, but like Daniel, we must continue to live by faith, moment by moment. Now, as we come to these last verses, I'll give some advanced comments so they don't bury the lead. James Montgomery Boyce said, Boyce said this about these verses that we're about to read. Quote, these are things here which we cannot yet explain. Close quote. Daniel Aiken said this, quote, here I must confess my lack of understanding. Close quote. Verse 10. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined. But the wicked shall act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. But those who are wise shall understand. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away, and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at 1,335 days. So we looked at this time of trouble. Now we're told this is going to be a time when many are going to purify themselves, be made white. But the wicked will not only continue, but they will increase in wickedness. They will not understand what's going on. They're not interested. And then the, this whole time we've been told it's a time, time, and half a time. We've been told it's uh, 1,260 days. We've been told it's 42 months. We're now told, oh, and from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up shall be 1,290 days. And we go, what? Oh, and then blessed is the one who makes it or who arrives, waits and arrives at 45 more days beyond that at 1,335 days. Now, here's what I'll say. At this point in my journey, I do not have a satisfactory answer to what those things mean. You know, John MacArthur had an explanation for the 30 days, um, as well as an explanation for the 45 days. He called the 30 days a time of purging, of cleansing. God created everything that he spoke it into existence. He only took six days to make everything, and he only took six days because he wanted to take that much time. He doesn't need 30 days to clear up something he made, and he could have made in six milliseconds. MacArthur calls the 45 dates the time to establish the blessed kingdom. I love John. John's a great uh, expositor. We don't agree at every point, but he's a great teacher. But here, he would have been more wise to say, I don't know. I don't even have a good speculation. Because anything that comes out of my mouth makes no sense. So now let me round this out. As we think about this, I do not believe God has given us dates so that we can mark our calendars on the Lord's return. No one knows the day or the hour. So even if we got to the 1260 days and there were 30 more and 45 more, I think we're missing the point if that's what we're trying to get from this text. Rather, what we need to understand is the exact day of the Lord's return and whatever happens next is marked out. This should cause you and I to live every day in light of that great truth. Now, as you look at this, just so you know, all of a sudden we're back talking about the abomination that makes desolate when these days are added. There are those who believe that this reflects back to additional days during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, so Antiochus IV, and that these 30 days and 45 days are in relation to that. Could be. Don't know. There are those who believe, no, no, these are the time as we look at Luke 21, 20, and 22, when Jerusalem was compassed about with armies, that abomination of desolation, and it's 30 days and 45 days to that. I don't know. Could be. While others believe this is the future final abomination of desolation, which Jesus spoke of and has nothing to do with Jerusalem, it's yet future. It's out there at the very end. 
I don't know. <laughs> I have nothing to say. Again, I'll say it again. There's no satisfactory answer. And everyone I've read, to be honest with you, is just a man straining for an answer. I, I don't find one that makes any sense other than God has set these days and he will fulfill them. Now, obviously, as we think about this, 1260 plus 30 plus 45, it heightens the sense of mystery that surrounds our Lord's timing. It heightens the need for you and I to persevere even in difficult times because blessed is the one who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. Verse 13, but go your way. Here it is again. You're dismissed, Daniel. Go your way to the end. You shall rest and stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. And here's the lesson for Daniel, and here's the lesson for you and I. I present unto you the book of Daniel. Now, go your way. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep living your life for Christ. The reality is one day he's coming back. The day is set. And whether you've gone to be with him or you're still here, you're going to partake in that great resurrection day when you get a new glorified body. So whether you are awake and alive or asleep in Christ and alive, you will partake, partake in that day. And no time of trouble can separate you, can prevent you from receiving your ultimate inheritance. And so I'll just end with probably somewhere I started, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, at the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. For when this corruptible puts on incorruption, when this mortal puts on immortality, then will be brought to pass the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. John 5, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall come forth. Those that have done good unto the resurrection of life, those that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. There is a great getting up morning coming one day. So Jesus in Daniel chapter 12, where is Jesus in Daniel chapter 12? Well, he's, he's the one more than likely above the river. He's the one talking to Daniel. He's the one clothed in the priestly garment. He is the sovereign of the universe who not only sets the 1260, but then goes and sets the 1290 and whatever that means and whatever period of time it's connected to, and then sets the 1335 along with whatever period of time that's connected to. He is the one he is the sovereign of the universe, but he's not just the one who controls time. He is the one who will ultimately put down that final man of sin. But not only is you know Jesus the sovereign of time, he's also the one who will put down the final man of sin. He will do so. In fact, I love how it's described in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8, and then, the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. He'll be put down like a dog with just the thought, just the breath of Jesus Christ. So indeed, Jan Daniel chapter 12, where is Jesus? He's all over it. Um, and then finally, we move to faith lessons in Daniel 12. And we've talked a lot about these things as we went. So I'll just quickly run through them. Daniel 12, 3. It's us, the believers, who will shine like the brightness of the firmament because we are the wise. We have placed faith in Jesus Christ. We are indeed wise. And just like Moses reflected the glory of God by spending time with God, you and I as believers reflect his glory by spending time with him. 12.3, we are the ones who will turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. We are his witnesses. We are the ones who he uses to bring the gospel to others so that they might be saved. Daniel 12, 13, we are the ones who will arise to our inheritance at the end of the days. So although it is his story, he has you and I, us believers, intermixed and intermingled in it for his glory. And one day, 
we will receive our glorified bodies and enter into heaven with him forever. I present to you the book of Daniel, 16 weeks, a super fun study. Lord willing, I'll see you next week as we take a leap into 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, the introduction in chapter 1. God bless you.